Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural flagship episode of my podcast. I struggled with the name for a long time, and I've been sitting on the name Seven Minutes in Evan for a long time. A long time. I thought Seven Inches in Evan. Nah, this already, we're not going to get any sponsors with this thing. But I feel like that was the most clever name I could think of. Seven Minutes in Evan, which happened to be my first Instagram name. I thought about going with that, and that's what I'm going with right now. And obviously, it's not going to be seven minutes long, but for now, it's cute, right? It's kind of cute. I also didn't want to film my first episode. Uh, Yeah, we're going to hear crows and shit. Uh, Someone is... Battling a witch out there. There was a witch conjuring up a spell or a potion, probably on me. Um, one time in college, that just reminded me. Uh, I met a, a witch, uh, a girl who was stuttering, studying. She didn't stutter, but she was studying to be, I forgot what her major was, but she was a witch, a full on voodoo mama, if you will. And, uh, I remember she told me she was putting like spells on bitches and shit and people in the class and she was doing good spells as well. And I remember she told me she was doing all these nice spells on me. And I remember I got a free burrito when she did that. And I kind of believed her. I kind of believed her. And um, the fucked up part is that she had a crush on me. And I didn't realize that at first. I thought she was just cool and kind of weird because... Uh, she was a witch, but it turns out she was weird because she was into me and she was putting these nice spells on me, like for money and to be lucky. And then I remember there was a weird moon and she flipped on me. She, I think because I didn't, uh, reiterate the, um, interest that she put a bad spell on me and I've been dealing with that ever since it's been about 10 years. I want to say, um, Hopefully it wears off after the decade because I'd be fucked up if we were in college. We were just kids and you put that spell on me. You wanted me to carry that for the rest of my life. I hope you put a 10, like a 10 year limit on that thing. This came to me thinking about the crows. She probably had a crow now that I think about it. But uh, I wanted to put this episode out before the new year. I'll be honest. I had a depressing moment this morning where... I've been writing in a journal every single morning, at least a page a day, and uh, it's been great for my mental health. You know, we all got mental health issues. We all deal with depression, anxiety, stress, and I say depression when I deal with it in the sense I've just had some depressing moments in my life, and uh, one of the best things for me was getting a journal. It was a gift from my girl, and... uh, It's the gift that keeps on giving because you start picking up on patterns and things you do and kind of a trend in what you're writing about. And you start being able to step back. You don't take offense or get defensive when it's your own brain. You're picking a part of why you do certain things. Um, So I highly recommend getting a journal. But the one thing that I experienced today was I decided to go back to 2018, December 31st. And I read that day. And it was almost too similar to my 2019, where that was really annoying. That's going to be things I try not to do going forward. But this is the first episode, baby. We're just figuring this shit out. Um, There's too many similarities with things that I needed to focus on and put my attention on. And uh, one of the things I wrote in 2018 was, okay, we're going to start podcasting this week, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do it two or three times a week. We're going to do this and that. And it's like you start seeing trends of things you should have done before, but you weren't. And that's one thing that I'm trying to get better with is uh, I'm sure you've heard the 80-20 rule that like 80% of your work is wasted. Like 80% of your business comes from 20% of your work. So it's all about like what's giving you the most return on investment. And that's like the thing you're supposed to do is look at your business see what that 20% is, and somehow amplify that. And I apply that to life where I'm just like, I want to do a lot more stand-up. I want to do podcasts and videos. And uh, there we did it again. And 
uh, one thing that was lacking was doing the stuff like this, the podcast. And I try to do story times and everything, but sometimes those those aren't as relatable. Like you really got to know me to find those stories interesting, you know, because it's only about me. It's not about something that our shared, you know, things are about. But um, those are harder to kind of, I don't know, get traction with. But, um, oh, dude, all right, I need to stop that. That's ridiculous. I'm going to start editing those out now that I think about it. But um, I don't know. I'm trying to spend less time doing busy work and doing things that aren't moving me towards my goals. And that's been a huge thing for me this past year was uh, figuring out what I enjoy doing the most and trying to do that as much as possible. And I think one thing that I've dealt with is uh, this turned into like Dr. Phil so fast is that I'm naturally by design is uh, I'm not antisocial. But I'm kind of antisocial in the sense of uh, I grew up homeschooled and I wasn't really around a lot of people. So like socializing, when I first started doing it, I was I had a lot of social anxiety where I was just like, you know, I was the new kid all the time in my life. And uh, so I think I tend to do things and, and stay in the comfort zone of things that I know, things that I know, uh, boxing, jujitsu. Um, working out, basically a lot of sports stuff. That's my comfort zone. Being funny and all this stuff is, uh, yeah, that's my comfort zone. But like being on stage and, uh, I don't know, doing new things like podcasting and everything like that, it's not necessarily my comfort zone because it's new, it's foreign. And sometimes I just revert back into my my little shell, if you will. And I'm like, ah, let's just stick with what we know. And then I'll put it on my list for things to do, but then I won't do it all. I'll find other like kind of meticulous things that I need to do. And, oh, I need to focus on this and this and this. But if I was just focusing on that one thing the whole time, I probably would have uh, got through it faster. So this is something I've been dealing with in 2019. You know, Happy New Year. I think this probably will end up coming out on the first. And uh, I was trying not to have it be like a, a New Year's thing where it was going to be my New Year's resolution to do this. One thing I've realized is that I've gotten much more sympathetic and sensitive to people who have New Year's resolutions. And I get it now because after having a year where I'm doing stand-up, running my video production business, um, trying to work out and be a competitive jiu-jitsu person... um, Man, so being pulled in all the different directions, I've gotten so overwhelmed this past year. And when I say overwhelmed, I say that with caps because uh, or quotations because uh, and caps. Yeah, we'll throw some caps on there. Maybe an exclamation point, maybe in red ink underlined. But uh, overwhelmed and stressed out because I kind of was burning the candle at all ends. I'm split new ends of that candle and start lighting it and trying to balance so many different careers, if you will. That was another quotations for the listeners. And uh, it was rough. And uh, I got stressed out all the time. I was getting sick a lot. I got fucking shingles this year. I got the goddamn scars on my side now. For the rest of my life, I wear the mark of the beast. I've been shamed. And I know uh, just reading about it, for me to get at my age, it's uh, the doctor was like, hey, what can I help you with? And I was like, I think I got shingles, doc. And he was like, ha, ha, ha. You're way too young to get shingles. And then I was like, okay, you know, I'm not going to do your job. Go ahead and you run me through the test. And I take my shirt off. Uh, and he was just like, whoa, shit. All right. Well, you got shingles, kid. Uh, what's going on? And then uh, he ended up giving me the antivirals and everything that, to get rid of it. It's basically like grown up uh, chicken pox. That's what it is. It's got some weird rules, too, because it's like once you have it, you're probably not going to get it again. But it's not contagious to people who have had chicken pox. So it's only contagious to people who haven't had chicken pox and are adults. It's weird shit. I think they just didn't really put much effort into it because it happens only to old people. So they're like, ah, we don't really need to study this. Only old people are going to get it. Fuck them. Um, but yeah. So I think because of all that stuff, I was being stressed out all the time. And, uh, 
big thing that I'm saying, what I'm point I'm making is that I've enjoyed taking the past couple weeks and kind of let my body reset and kind of, uh, not pushing too hard during the holidays. I kind of, uh, because I got shingles Thanksgiving, I was like, okay, time to relax. Maybe, uh, pump the brakes a little bit, kid. Okay. And, uh, I still had shows and everything to do all through November. I had a couple shows December, and uh, I got stuff early January. But um, I kind of pumped the brakes, and I kind of relaxed and kind of did what I want. And I'm still working every single day, but I'm not. I'm trying to rest more. And that's something that uh, I didn't go too hard on this past week. And I like the idea of, you know, I break down my weeks into a schedule of what I do for the week. I have a to-do list every single day. Because uh, I'm kind of neurotic, I guess you could say, with that. Because uh, I grew up homeschooled and, you know, I'm the fourth child. And uh, my parents, they didn't always have that attention for me. There was four of us. There was a lot of mouths to feed. My dad was working all the time. Um, and he was coaching a swim team at the same time. So for me, being homeschooled and not having a lot of structure... It was rough once I became an adult because I wasn't used to waking up early. I wasn't used to uh, like keeping to a schedule. So naturally, if I don't have like if I don't keep myself accountable, because since I do run my own business and I'm like doing basically stand up, everything I do for some reason, you have to have be accountable for yourself. And I think that's the only way I can function. And maybe that's because of being homeschooled and not having that structure where I can't deal with a boss. I can't deal with people telling me what to do. I'll revolt. I'll have a strike. I'll tear your business down. We'll protest. Take fire torches to the street. But I didn't, uh, if I don't have that accountability, I'll just, the wheels come off. I'll just, I don't know what to do. And uh, so for me, I always have a to-do list every single day. I wake up, boom, make my bed, make coffee is on the list. I get a couple easy ones out of the way. But I have my whole day structured for what I'm going to do and make sure I'm getting things done that I need to get done. And then I have a weekend schedule also. And then I have a kind of like a review of what I want to fix in the upcoming week and what I did right or wrong during the week. I look at the entire year like that now where it's like, okay, What did I do this year that brought me closer to my goals? What did I do? What were the trends that kept me away from them? What like got me closer? What got me farther away? And then look at it. It was like resolutions. You can call them resolutions, you know, and just really try to stick to them. Stick to those guidelines. Don't get too crazy with it where, you know, I'm not like, I'm going to be a millionaire by the end of 2020. It's like, no, I'm going to try to make this much money per a month. And I'm going to accomplish these goals. And I'm going to make them attainable. And one thing, like, if someone is going to make goals, structure them, you know. Structure them where they're objective. And there's actually, like, they're measurable. When some people say, I just want to be happy, you're not going to achieve that because happiness is fake. No, I'm kidding. Um, It's not, you can't measure happiness like that. Um, What you can measure is what are the things that make you happy. Is going to the gym two, three times a week, does that make you happy? Does learning how to cook or take up a hobby is the byproduct of those things making you happy? We'll do that. Find out what makes you happy and make sure that you make time for doing those. And that's how I think you'll hit that goal of being happy. Hashtag Guru Evan. Just changing your fucking life. Yeah, I'm excited for 2020. There's There's a couple things that I'm definitely going to work on. And one of them is going to be overtraining. I work out way too much, you know, and uh, I do too much shit in the gym and then I don't have energy to do the things I need to do. And then uh, I get sick and I, it's like a vicious cycle. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to stay out of the gym as much. And I think focus on eating better, which I eat pretty good, but I'm just going to, I'm just, you know, hindsight 2020 at the end of the day. Oh, one thing I saw current event. Uh, the Cats movie. The Cats movie came out, and that shit lost seven. That shit lost seventy million dollars. Wild, wild. Who didn't see this coming? I'll be honest with you. I think partly to me getting shadow banned. I said that with some twang. 
shadow banned on Instagram. And it's a conspiracy that I was shadow banned, but it just, certain things started happening at a weird time. My engagement dropped so fucking hard. Um, One of the things was when I started making fun of vegans, as you can see, I just don't do it on Instagram right now. I don't talk about vegans at all because there was a revolt and a lot of you vegans attacked me so aggressively in my inbox when I, you know, was just working out a little bit of material and poking some fun. You guys know what's silly to be a vegan, right? God damn it, we're doing it again, Evan. Listen, you guys live your own life. But some of my stories got taken down for bullying. Apparently, I was bullying the Instagram community. And ever since then, my engagement dropped so hard. So I think I'm on the timeout list. Um, But before I was going at the vegans, I started going at cat people. And it all spurred from this cat's movie. You know, Cats on Broadway. I hear that it's an amazing play. In fact, my parents, my mom was telling me recently that uh, one of the first dates my dad took her on was to a Cats musical. My dad's from Brooklyn, and he was trying to stunt, you know, with the plays of Broadway. Yeah, let's go on catch a show. My dad's Puerto Rican with a thick New York accent, and he's just like, yeah, a little bit of coffee. He's that kind of guy. But Cats is supposed to be amazing, the, the show on Broadway. As for the movie, I saw the trailer of that and I was like, we're not ready for this. This is, uh, this is going to hit hard with the furry community, but that's about it. No one wants to watch that shit. I didn't want to watch it. They're weird little bodies. They're half human, half cats. You, tr- you trying to confuse me? Because that's what you're just doing is me seeing these weird hot ass cats. I'm... It's confusing times, okay? I don't need this in my life. I already got people telling me that I can't identify as a man. Next option for me is I'm like, all right, I might be a cat man, you know? Because there's some hot-ass cats walking them streets in this movie. Um, And it had a huge cast. A huge cast. There was star-studded, if you will. And it's just not doing good at all. That is such a hard thing to... Uh, the special effects, everything, like, man, keep it simple, stupid. Why not do it, like, with cats? Make it a cartoon. I think that's what they should have done, was just make it a cartoon. But they tried doing the half, you know, CGI thing, and it just always looks bad. You either got to go so hard into it where you're doing just a straight, an- like, an animation, or just stay away from it. It doesn't look good. You know who does terrible with their special effects? The Walking Dead. Sometimes you'll see like, oh, they ran out of budget. Oh, they're really skimming right now. You'll see like a gunshot to a zombie. And we're just like, oh, wow, that's what we're doing? That's what we're doing now, Walking Dead? No wonder fucking Rick Rhymes left. Andrew Lincoln was like, there's not a dictatorship anymore. He's gone. But I like where that season is going now. But cats, man. I just don't respect cats in general. There's nothing, they do nothing for me, emotionally, spiritually. I've never really been a cat person. My sister had a cat growing up, and it was, it was, uh, it was a lot, you know, having to deal with that thing, and uh, I really, I didn't, I, I liked it sometimes, but it would pee on everything, it was very territorial, it held grudges. That's one thing I realized about cats is they hold grudges. Like I would, you know, kick it in self-defense and that night my bed would be peed on. Like it was just like, okay, I'm going to remember you. I'll tag you back. And uh, it would. It always did. And I'm not, uh, I'm just not fond of cats. And when I was making fun of the cats movie, I started going hard on cat people. And, you know, that was more fun. They were having a good time with it, and we were understanding it was a joke, but the vegan people, you guys, you guys are a vicious little community. For someone who, who is uh, all about peace and not hunting and hurting animals, y'all hurt me emotionally, spiritually, my Instagram. Y'all went so hard at me. You hurt me. You hurt my feelings. You hurt my heart. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, I'm part vegan. I'm definitely part vegan. You know, I eat meat and I'm vegan. I'm vegan. I'm a 
meat eater. I'm keto. I'm also uh, a pescatarian. No, is that the fish one or is that a religion? Yeah. I'm all those things, you know, a pescapellian. I don't know. I'm a reptilian. I don't know. I kind of just eat everything. I don't know exactly where this is going now. Um, I am a dog person, though. I'll be honest. I have a lot of dog material on stage, like why people, you know, should like dogs more than cats, because I relate to it. And right now I have my dog from my parents right now. And my, uh, I'm babysitting. I'm dog sitting right now. We're doing a test run of having my dogs move in with me because I live in an apartment. And they say we're not allowed to have dogs, but everybody in Ventura has a dog. It's just the way it is out here. And uh, I realized that I get why parents just talk about their kids all the time. Because that's like all their life revolves around is the kid and having kids. And Because I, I, I feel it with my dog now. I've had my dog. I have to take it out twice a day now because... At my parents, my dog has a huge backyard. It doesn't need to be walked. It doesn't need anything. You just put some food in a bowl, and that dog is self-sufficient. But here, I have to like really take care of it, take it on walks, try to socialize it. So I'm like basically treating it like a it's a kid, where I'm like, I got to take care of this thing, and even after doing very minimal tasks, I feel my I'm like connecting to the dog world more, where I'm just like, oh, how old is your dog? You know that kind of thing. You know, you you kind of start being attached to it and like you start telling your single friends, you're just like, hey, man, you should think about getting a dog really improves your life a lot. And that's the way parents are. They get so into the, their kids and telling you, you should have kids. One day I'll have kids. But right now, no, I don't. I, I just got the training wheels on the dog right now. That's what I'm that's what my life is. I don't, I don't need a goddamn kid in my life. People get so annoyed with that shit. When are you going to have kids? When are you going to do it? Oh, don't you, aren't you ready? No, I'll fucking tell you when I'm ready, you know? I've done pretty good being responsible at this point. I'm winning right now, you know? Keeping my life good. Not having a little kid tethering me down, you know? That's why people want you to have kids, because they're in that world. And they're like, we could basically go to the dog park. That's what it's equivalent of, is when you're like, you should get a puppy, then we can go to the dog park together. It's like, you should get a kid and be miserable with me, you know? That whole career, you don't need it. Hopes and dreams? Put them into this kid. Maybe they'll make it to the NFL. I bet that was pretty triggering for some people. That's just how I feel. Y'all attack me. I'll attack you right back. I'm not going to suffer fools and your agenda. Having kids. One day. One day I would like to, and then I'll flip my switch completely and be like, listen, I know I was saying I shouldn't have kids, but now that I got them, you should too. We can go to the dog park together. How about our kids get chicken pox together? I'm going to do that. I'm going to be that kind of parent where like my best friend makes sure he has a kid at the same time. And then uh, when my kid gets chicken pox, I'm just going to bring it over to his house, the kid, and uh, just make my kid wrestle his kid. And then tell him after, be like, surprise, your kid has chicken pox too. Let them take a bath together and put whatever calamine lotion is on there. I fucking just dealt with adult chicken pox, goddamn shingles. Felt like I was living in the goddamn Oregon Trail getting something called shingles. Fuck around and, what is it, dysentery? Evan died of fucking dysentery on the Oregon Trail. I always fantasize about that, about living off the land, like that kind of thing. Like, I feel like people really, like, we think life was always better before, you know? Like, we see old pictures, and we're like, man, great wilderness. That was when it was great. Life was so simple back then. But really, people were dying of the goddamn common cold. You just get an infection. Not know what it was and just die. <laughs> You'd be out just fishing for food. A goddamn bear would eat you. That shit ain't fun. It is crazy because I think I think there's a lot of us that like we always like when you do get out in nature, there's something that's really nice about it. Like fishing, catching a fish and 
cooking it right there and making some veggies over fire and stuff. There's something so satisfying on a primal level. Like I think technology and society has evolved so fast, faster than we can catch up. So like our software is all developed, but our hardware just hasn't caught up yet. So like it's an issue because we still need these like primal needs of like hunting for food and all this satisfying stuff that like we don't necessarily necessarily need anymore. That's like the whole like unfulfilled life of working in a cubicle and shit. I think there's something like in humans that like you have to hunt and you have to feel like you can contribute. Like that's what's weird is like you see it with kids who are just born into money and people who just got money. Like trust fund babies and shit. They never, it never ends well for them. Like I don't know what the way to do it because like you want to make money and you want to give your kids a good life. But, like, you got to give them that struggle. And you can't give them uh, a sense of security, as fucked up as that sounds. Like, I feel like you got to kind of struggle a bit and feel like, shit, there's no safety net. Because it'll, like, force you to build something. If you think about it, I always use the metaphor of working out. That muscles are built under resistance. And that's, like, how you got to develop your strength for life and everything is, like, you kind of need real resistance or else it's like, what's the fucking point? What's the goddamn point of it all? That's like with stand-up and everything. When shows are going too good, I'm like, oh, there's a bomb coming somewhere around the corner. There's a goddamn grenade just randomly waiting for me at a show. And then it just, it's the best thing to ever happen to you. When shit sucks, like failure, I think failure is the best thing to happen to a career. In any, like anything, because that's when you're going to make the biggest leaps. Like, especially with stand up, something that's just so humiliating. Like, literally, it's just embarrassing when you bomb. And you only bomb if you care that you're bombing. So, it's like, if you're being honest with yourself, there's a lot of people who are delusional and they're just like, oh, terrible crowd, blah, blah, they just didn't get me. I wish I had that kind of delusion. But I'm always like, fuck, if I can't turn a crowd, it's on me. And it's just like, shit, it's gut-wrenching. I'm just like, God damn, this is so bad right now. And then I cringe all night long, thinking about all the material. And I'm like, ah, where did I lose them? Where did I mess up? Oh, I let that get to me. You know, I got to let this, I got to like, the material needs to be fixed. And I think by, by nature, I always try to do that. Whenever I have a set, I always go back to, to notes and everything. And I look at things, I try to change little words do a lot of editing. I'll usually listen to the set on the way home after I did it. Try to watch it if I can, if I record it with my phone. And uh, I always record with my phone, the audio at least. But I try to get the video too because I can pick up on my mannerisms, certain things, the delivery, how I was standing, my posture. Um, and it's been the biggest thing that's helped me. Um, but I'll go through it then and I'll give it a listen. And then I'll listen again the next morning. Uh, while I'm writing the jokes, while I have everything mapped out. Uh, This got a laugh, but that didn't really. Is there a better way I could say this? How's this going to get me to this sentence? Does that need to be there? And I like, I trim the fat out of things. And it's like the process of that, ugh, I love it. And uh, it's been one of those things like transitioning from uh, doing music and everything into stand-up is... By design, stand-up is way better for me in the sense of me putting out material because the jokes are never going to be 100% finished. There's always going to be a better way to do it. There's always going to be more polished way, and it can just improve. So by nature, jokes are always a work in progress. Music, on the other hand, with me, I'm insanely a perfectionist when it comes to me putting something out, which... uh, if you see some of my older music, you'd be like, that's for sure a lie, Evan. You put out some dog shit. And yeah, I did. But at the time, that was perfection to me because I just didn't have the experience or the perception to understand that that wasn't good. Like I didn't know yet. You know, on the surface, it looked good to me. Um, so I would re-record songs over and over and over and over again. I would mix them over and over and over and over and over again. 
and I would hear like one sentence in the song that I didn't like, and I'd be like, okay, got to start this shit over, you know, and it would just constantly, I put out such a little amount of material because I produced everything myself from the instrumental, from recording myself, from mixing it to mastering it to having someone hold the camera to shoot it and then I would edit the video. That's how I got into video production was through music necessity because I was broke and uh, I would need video. So I'd be like, okay, well now I got to shoot videos if I'm going to keep up in the music world. And uh, I kind of just learned how to do all of that. So when you're doing everything just to put out one small thing it takes so long for me because I'm perfectionist and uh, I didn't have the funds to go in a studio and get it produced and with me being weird, uh, I've had the option. I've had people want to sign me to a label and shit like that. I never did it because, and it could be, you know, something that I fucked up with. I don't like people having ownership over me, you know? And that sounds weird to say, but like, I don't, I don't like how the music industry is by nature of, you know, these record labels would, at least at the time when I was getting offered stuff, it wasn't good for you. It wasn't good for the music artist. And now things are getting better with like Spotify and like the barrier for entry is changed a lot. And I think that's one of the most amazing things that's happening with music is the power <clears throat> is coming back to the music artist. It's coming back to the comedian. It's coming back to, you know, the actor, whatever you are, the creator. It's an amazing time to be a creative person in the world. Um, there's not as many people who are able to stand in your way if you're willing to adapt and learn how to do certain things. Like that's why I'm very happy with the way things are going with me in the sense of I do have all the tools I need. And that's why I sometimes get mad at myself because I have everything I need to produce anything I want with it, you know, hashtag humble break, like podcast videos, music, everything I want, I have all the tools at my disposal. Cause I worked a lot of years doing terrible shit to be able to get all this, you know? And I don't mean I was out there whoring. I just mean I, I worked a lot of odd jobs to be able to pay for all this shit. It's funny how <clears throat> people still say shit like, oh, you're so lucky you have all that equipment in a studio. Wow. I'm like, yeah, bitch, I was a food delivery truck driver. I worked Uber. I worked Lyft. I worked construction. I was a personal trainer. I was a boxing trainer. I was a swim coach. I'd give swim lessons. I've done a lot of shit. Graphic design, sell a lot of shirts. I do a lot of shit. Just be able to invest it in me. Like, I don't go out and party at all. Not anymore. Talk to me when I was in high school, college. No, then I was partying. But like, I don't really spend money on things that are just like a weekend thing. You know, I don't really buy myself luxuries. I'll buy myself a microphone. I'll buy myself a computer. I'll buy myself some lights. I'll spend in that kind of stuff, you know? And that's why I think anybody can make those sacrifices. Like when people want to say, oh, I wish I could buy that camera, you know, because I have a $2,000 camera. No big deal. Um, it's actually really cheap for a DSLR. But like $2,000, if you're going out to dinner twice a week, you know, or twice a month even, We'll say it's like fifty, a hundred dollars you're spending. Sometimes that food budget of you know you going out twice a week can add up to be able to pay off a camera in a year. So like, just make that small sacrifice. You can do it too, baby. I'm rooting for you. Um, yeah, yeah. That's my life right now. That's what we're dealing with. Um, my dog's just looking at the door. Just giving you a random update. Shit's hard doing it by yourself. I plan on having guests on the podcast. I didn't want to be tethered to uh, a podcast host and uh, one of the options of just being able to do it whenever I wanted to do it and uh, like stick to my own schedule. And who knows if other people, you know, a co host was able to make it every single time I wanted to film it or within my schedule. And I just don't like when I want to do something and I like, and discipline and have the structure and everything. If someone isn't there all the time or if we don't match up on how we are, it's just not going to work. And plus, I want to interview certain people. I want to do podcasts with people randomly. Don't have to go through someone else to have that interview with them or talk to them. I'm saying interview with them. Just have that conversation, you know, because I feel like conversations are like the best thing that you can have 
And it's like me just being a, uh, I digest a lot of podcasts and, uh, they're like my favorite thing. I learned so much from them. And, uh, one of the things is I feel like I might be too young to do a podcast and granted I'm 32. I'm, I'm getting up there. I consider myself an old bird now. Um, but the reason why I think a lot of people like, uh, the Joe Rogans and the Jordan Peterson and, uh, even like the Tom Segura's and, you know, these older comedians. And I'm sorry, Tom, if you're younger than I think. Uh, but basically life experience. Like I don't want to listen to a 22-year-old talk about their life, you know. I think that's why comedians in general, like I do know a couple of comedians that are like 17, 18. And the ability for them to know joke structure and to get up there and to tell jokes and be figuring it out that age by the time that they're in their 30s, they're going to be fucking murderers, murderers. But I don't know if they're going to be able to write that certain material that will connect with an audience uh, on stage at that age when your life experience is such little, you know, you don't really know too much about the world. I mean, maybe you'll find some stuff, but like I think overall, uh, you kind of got to have a little more years under your belt to being a commanding uh, point in a podcast and everything. And that's why I'm just taking it light, baby. I don't give a shit. I feel like uh, having certain conversations and everything is good, and I'm looking forward to doing that. And uh, just living the dream, you know, figuring this thing out, figuring out life. One thing I like is that uh, the way the Internet has, you know, grown as I got older is... You start realizing that you're really not alone. Because I'll have times in my life where I feel alone. Hashtag emo. And uh, in the ways of like, I feel like I'm dealing with something. Like this is a very unique experience of like something that you're dealing with in your life. And then you'll go on the internet and you'll see other people posting about it. And you're like, oh yeah, this is kind of a universal thing that we all have struggles. And we all have to deal with them in our own ways. And then you feel better. You have that uh, that goombaya, we are the world feel. And, uh, excuse me. That's something I wish I had when I was younger. When I was going through some real dark shit in my life. I wish I, that's how old I am. And I was, I was around before the internet turned into the internet. I was around when the internet was still like brand new. Like dial up. You remember that? AOL. You would fucking... You pick up your phone, kick motherfuckers off their games and shit. Be like, oh yeah, you think you're gonna play with me? I need make, I need to call fucking PetSmart. See if they have a deal on goldfish. You motherfuckers playing around the internet. I'm just gonna hold the phone on, and kick you the fuck off. That's how I lived my life growing up. I didn't give a shit. Gotta use the goddamn phone. But I remember when the internet first came out. I was like, what the fuck is this? There's a world in the computer. And I remember I had, an, I had a nickname growing up. I think, I forgot, it was Charlie Runyon, this kid. He called me Rat Fink. And for some reason it stuck with me. I, I turned that, that, you know, I've always been one about flipping things into a positive. And I took the nickname and I, I made it my own. Where I was like, I'm fucking Rat Fink. And uh, I wanted my email address to be Rat Fink. And I also had a rat named Rat Fink. I ended up naming the rat Rat Fink after that. A pet rat. It wasn't one that I just stumbled across and made my own. I bought it from a pet store. And uh, I remember I wanted the email address, ratfink at AOL.com. And somehow there was already a ratfink at AOL.com. So what did I get? I got some generic bullshit AOL.com uh, suggested choice. I think my mom was like, I don't have time for this bullshit. This is your email. And it gave me rat one alert. That was my email address. And what did I do? I emailed Ratfink, not knowing that they, I didn't know how email worked. So at the time, it was brand new. It was a wild west of emailing. I put an email from rat one alert to Ratfink, but I put in like the subject piggy diggy at AOL.com, and I just threatened Rat Fink. I was like, you better watch yourself. Taking that name. Watch out. I was like eight 
years old. And I was sending threats on the internet to ratfink at AOL.com. So ratfink at AOL.com, if you're out there, I meant no harm. I hope you didn't move your family to Russia or somewhere else fearing for your life. And Piggy Diggy, I'm sorry I brought you into the mix as well. I don't know why I did that. I don't know what I was thinking. I thought that like I could make an email go from Piggy Diggy to Rat One Alert. And I don't, I'll be honest, I don't know where Piggy Diggy came from. It's not the coolest thing I ever did with my life. You know, I've made some bad choices in my life. I've got some karma for those choices. I was thinking about this. I once, uh, do you ever have those moments? Fuck it, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go for it. I'm just gonna say it. I, uh, I one time, this was gonna be a story time, but since I'm not gonna do story time for a little bit, this can be a, a podcast story time where I got dosed, uh, with medical marijuana edibles when I was in college. I was, uh, at that point, I still was a good kid, and I didn't really partake in the devil's lettuce. I enjoy it now, you know. It's, it's medicinal. I, I use a lot of CBD in my life. Very little THC, you know. I hit the little vape pen like one of these hipsters. I enjoy it. It takes the edge off. But even then, I still do it maybe once a month or something. do CBD more regularly. Um, I'm looking for CBD sponsors, by the way. But in college, I was uh, I was lifeguarding, and me and this lifeguard, we had a class together in college, and then we'd walk together. It was intro to Western civilization, and we would walk from class to the pool we both lifeguarded at on campus. And I remember he had a box of brownies in class, and this is how, you know innocent I was I didn't know what they were and I should have you know obviously you go to college you see a guy with brownies you're like oh yeah those are for sure marijuana pot brownies but I didn't know and he goes hey I made these I go oh, tight I guess that's cool that you're in the baking and uh he goes you want one and I said sure I like brownies I used to be a fat kid half my life of course I want a brownie I take the brownie I eat it and I remember it tasted weird I remember I was like, man, this is a weird-ass brownie. I don't want to embarrass him, though. He looks like he's from Ohio or some shit. Really hippy-dippy. He's for sure made this without any sugar and, you know, granola shit. It tasted like really bland granola. You know, they have, like, this really healthy vegan granola. I'm sorry, vegans, but they have, like, really healthy granola. It tastes like that. It was very dry, and it had a weird taste. And obviously, now I know it, it was marijuana. And I remember I ate the whole thing. And he's like laughing. And I'm like, oh. And he looks over. He goes, did you eat the whole thing? And I go, yeah, man. Delicious. You got a, your regular old Betty Crocker. You got a future in this kid. And then he goes, check it out. And he shows me the label. And it said uh, medicinal marijuana edibles. And it had the warning thing on there. And I'm like, <gasps> what? And then uh, he was like, yeah, 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 I made these. I got these from the dispensary. And now I was thinking back in the story. I remember him telling me later on that he would sell them or get them for his neighbors that needed them medically. So he worked at one of the very first medical dispensaries back before we realized what medical dispensaries were. This was like in 2007 or something like that. Yeah, 2007. And uh, I remember looking at him being like, dude, what? I don't know what, I don't know what this is going to do. I'm, I'm scared. I need an adult because I was just like 19 at the time. I wasn't no goddamn adult. And I remember he was like, dude, you're going to be all right. <laughs> and this motherfucker took one too. So, fuck it. I guess we're in this together, brothers in arms. And I remember we started walking to the pool. And I'm like, we have to protect motherfuckers' lives right now. I don't know if I remember how to swim right now. Okay? I'm just going to have to throw a buoy and let them figure it out. Because I'm not getting in there right now. And I remember sitting down. And I had like a six-hour block of time that I had to guard this pool. And I remember when it set in, it was just the worst panic. And I was just like, shit, sitting there. And it was like, 
the first class that came through, it wasn't like a general public pool. It was like these uh, senior citizens. And I remember I was having an existential crisis about their meaning of life and how life ends and all this shit. And when we're old and one day I'm going to be there and thinking about it. And I'm just like, fuck, Tabitha, get away from the deep end. It's not your time. You know, and I'm just like, Ralph, Ralph, don't swim that way. You need to breathe. You ate too much pudding. You eat pudding when you get old. That's a one plus side. So I really like pudding, so I'm looking forward to that. But um, and then I remember we had like the the special ed class came in after, and that was another existential crisis at that point of having you know feeling uh, like man how different life can be for for other people and just how hard it can be for others and how I felt guilty that I've had a good life and everything and you know. It just was like, it was a crazy experience. And I remember my boss who uh, came over randomly to like to talk to me. And I remember I barely spoke English. I was just like, uh, the people were coming up to me and I was trying to pretend I was a human. I wasn't at the time. And that shit was wild. I don't, I don't mess with edibles. They aren't my thing. I'm not really keen on edibles at all because it's just such a long time and they can be so intense. But I mean, I've only had experiences like in the Wild West days. I don't... I know they're doing a lot of shit in labs. It's kind of like balanced out as far as its accuracy. But I know the new marijuana they're making, that shit is just built in the lab. It's like fucking venom. It's like comparing a daddy long leg to venom. Like I think it would kill your grandparents if they tried to like compare some Woodstock shit to like what's out there now. They can't fuck with it. It's fucking Hulk, you know? Shit's wild. Pretty soon Disney's going to be making marijuana. Like, that's going to be a thing. Disney's just going to take over the goddamn world. There's going to, like, we're such a fucking machine for nostalgia that there's going to be, like, Disney gyms and shit where you just, like, they're just playing Disney music and you're running on Disney treadmills, watching Disney movies, and you're doing, like, Disney workouts. Like, now there's CrossFit and all this functional strength. Pretty soon, you're going to be acting out Disney movies where you're like, oh, I'm doing the, you know, bell dance class, and then I'm doing the frozen let it go run, and you know, I don't know, you get the point I'm making. Love that nostalgia shit. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this late last night in bed, just laying there staring at the ceiling, thinking about my whole life. Michael Phelps popped in my head. And I thought about it and I was like, I met Michael Phelps when I was a kid and he was at a swim meet that I was at a swim meet at. And I remember like a little jackass, I was probably still in my little fat days. I must've been like 12 or something. And he had already gone to Olympics. Like he was a big deal. And it was a big deal that he was at this meet. And I remember I saw him go in the warm up pool. I jumped in the same lane as him. And I sprinted as fast as I could just to touch his feet. And if you're not a swimmer, you don't know what this means. But it basically means you need to move the fuck over. Because the sheriffs came to town. Like, you know, pull over grandma and let the speed demon go by. It basically just tells the person in front of you, let me go ahead of you. And I did that to Michael Phelps. And he was probably, I think he was like on his second lap. He was just warming up going as slow as he could, just getting his body loose. And I sprinted like my life depended on it. And I barely touched his feet by the end of the lane. Like at the end of the lap, I caught him. And I was going as fast as I could. And he was warming up. You realize how embarrassing that is as an athlete? Like why why was I even in the same sport as Michael Phelps? I think it was a sick joke for my parents because I was a vasectomy baby like they didn't want me. So they're like, you know what? We'll teach him. Fucking put him in swimming. (laughs) Like if aliens came down and they saw me standing next to Michael Phelps, they for sure would be like, oh, that one owns that one. I put everything I could into that 25 racing Michael Phelps. And I remember he stopped and he looked at me. 
he finished the lap and then he stopped. Like I think Michael Phelps, he probably now that I think about it, has dealt with that a thousand times in his life. Like, oh yeah, someone thought they were funny and gonna stop. Michael Phelps, oh I caught Michael Phelps in the warm up pool. He's probably heard it all. And I just want to say, Michael Phelps, I'm sorry I did that to you. But that was probably my greatest accomplishment, you know, in swimming. Definitely my biggest feat. I was decent. I swam all four years CIF and swam in college. I was nothing great. Look at me. I'm built like a hobbit. I got no, I got no, that's the thing. It's like, that's why I'm doing this. I'm not built for athletics. I'm good at boxing because it's regulated by weight. I'm good at jujitsu. Semi good at jujitsu. But I'm okay as a person, you know, a jack of all trades. But like a sport like swimming, just not built for it, you know? Like I'm decent at swimming. I'm a good swimmer now to the regular person because I just invested so much time in it. Just so much time that could have gone into other things. You know that 80 20 rule that we were talking about? Swimming was like the 90% waste that gave me 10% return. I just didn't drown at the ocean. That was the biggest return that it gave me. And there was a couple scares. I remember in high school, maybe it was in college, but we might have been drinking the devil's nectar. I went out in the ocean. I almost drowned in a goddamn wave, and I was a collegiate swimmer. That's life telling me you're not built for this. You're not built for this, you know? Go make shoes in a factory or something, you know? That's what I'm built for. Just sitting down, hunkering down and doing something. Digging holes and shit. I think I'd be good at war. I think that's what I was probably... I come from like savages in Puerto Rico. We're not tall folk, but man, I could probably fight so good in a jungle. You get me up in a rainforest, I'll find ways to survive. I'll be swinging around trees and shit. Let's see you fucking live there, Michael Phelps. Bring you to my world. I bet I bet I make better rice and beans than you. But I love you. I respect everything you've done. I'll invite you over for some rice and beans if you wanted. Maybe a pastel, some yuca, arroz con habichuelas, some tostones, buen provecho. I'll do that for you, Mikey. Come on over. Ah, that must have been so annoying to Michael Phelps, but. Because I think about it now. It's the same thing. It's the same thing as when people find out that I do stand up and they're like, oh, tell me a joke. Or comedians can relate to this shit. When you get off stage and everybody just thinks that they can do it, they think you're just up there talking. Like you didn't slave over these critical timing punchlines and taglines and setups and everything. And they go, yeah, I got a joke for you. I got a joke for you. Listen, I get, you know, I, 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 everybody tells me I should do stand up. You know what my favorite thing is? Do it. Go ahead. Try it. Get up there. (laughs) Anybody can do this. Everybody says I should do stand-up. Do it. Go on. Give it a shot. And it's not me hating, you know. It's not. It's me being like, try it. See what reality is. And there's been a couple times where hecklers, when I've gone to open mics and everything where they want to try it, they sign themselves up on the list. They're like, huh, yeah, I can do this. And they're like talking shit to everybody all night. And then they get a chance to go up and they say one line that they think is going to start off with a laugh and it gets nothing. And then you see them break down, just all it all falling apart. And it's, it's brutal to watch, but it's good. Because sometimes you got to let a motherfucker know. It's the same thing with fighting. I'm one of those people, since I know so many people who can fuck people up, when I get around certain, like, different worlds outside of fighting, because, you know, I grew up boxing and everything, when I'm around regular people and they're like, man, you're so tough, it's crazy that you can fight, I don't like talking about it. I don't like pretending that, I, that I'm, like, this crazy fighter. And it feels good for the ego to, like, if you indulge that, but I don't because I know, like, Russians exist I know what real fighters are out there, that people that have dedicated their entire life to it. But even I come across these people who say things like, yeah, bro, but I'm just a beast. And I'm like, oh, and I always give them the run. I'm like, so have you ever fought? No, but I'm like a beast. Street fights, bro. 
undefeated in street fights. I can fight in the street. Street fighter, bro. They made that game about me, you know. And I'm like, oh, so you never wrestled? Never did jiu-jitsu? Oh, you did karate when you were six? Oh, that's tight, bro. Oh, you got a black belt in karate. Cool, 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 cool. But it's like, I, I just feel like, I feel like everything is an investment of time. And like, it, it, it annoys me when anybody in any avenue tries to pretend like they could do what someone else could do, you know? It's like a it's like a weird little backhanded compliment thing. I'm like, oh, you're funny. People tell me I should do it. I could probably do it, but you know. And uh, but to bring that around, I don't. I when people do want to try stand up, like I've had people, and I always tell them, do it. I literally have the same answer for everybody. Do it. Just do it. Just go to an open mic. Write five minutes of material. Go to an open mic. Just do it. Because there's no preparation. There's nothing that's going to get you ready for it other than doing it. That's all it is, is you got to get up there and you got to experience and it'll get better. You're going to have to eat shit. You don't want to, you can try to be the person who's funny their first time on stage, but you're going to eat shit and you have to do that to get better. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the lesson I'm going to leave you ending 2019. Just do it. Fuck you, Nike. That's my quote. And no matter what, remember, I love you. I'll see you next time.